All right, so we have a lot of questions. Um, we'll try to get through as many as we can. We only have 15 minutes. Um, hopefully some of them will cover multiple people's questions. So um, our first question is, uh, Pulsed, can it be revoked um, at any time? And is it important to choose the provider? Is it important to choose a provider that is pro-life? Pulsed it can't actually be revoked, but it, you can fill out a new Pulsed form, and that's how you revoke it. Once you fill out, most Pulsed forms have um, multiple places where you can change your mind on things. And so you can revisit Pulsed and fill out a new one. But the only way to revoke a Pulsed is by filling out a new one and answering the questions differently than you did before. What was the second part of the question? Um, pro-life. Pro oh, of course, try to find a pro-life physician. But that's not always so easy to do. So, you know, sometimes you need to, I move a lot, and I go in and interview my doctor before I ever sign up with him and ask him all sorts of questions, and they think I'm a nut. But I don't care because I want to know if my doctor will do what I want him to do and not, you know, even if I disagree with him with what he would prefer to do, I want to know that he's going to do what I want him to do. All right. Um, this is directed towards Ron and Julie. Um, and it's about living will. Health care directives are misused and best not to have, and best not to have one. However, um, I've heard many argue that if they didn't had, if they hadn't had a living will expressing their wishes, the outcome would have been different. Please clarify whether a living will is, res is recommended. Well, um, we'll get Julie's side and uh, mine also. Um, I think we probably agree. Um, the living wills, we have to recognize, they came from the euthanasia people, and they're incremental steps towards euthanasia, but the society is what it is, and uh, they're being pushed. You go to the hospital, and they shove a bunch of forms in your face, or they're always encouraging you to fill these out. Um, there are protective medical documents. Julie mentioned some. The American Life League has one. National Right to Life Committee has another form. The um, Patient Rights Council website has another document. They're, they're slightly different. They're more geared towards a pro-life approach. So if you do fill out a living will, it needs to be done carefully with a pro-life focus, uh, asserting that you do want certain things. But I still would say the most important thing is to have the person your principal or the patient advocate who has the power of attorney, who knows that you respect life, that life is not to be killed, and therefore they will advocate for you in the unpredictable situations that always come up in healthcare. You can't predict everything and you can't envision what's gonna happen. But most people say, um, say they're, they're healthy, they become disabled or something, then later on they say, well, I thought I would have wanted to die, but now that I'm here, I still want to live because they find the purpose of life is still there. So you can't, you, you can't project what you would think later on, and these living wills get into that kind of predictive kind of thing. It's kind of questionable, which means it, that we understand it came from the euthanasia people. The most important thing is the patient advocate or principal. I think Ron meant agent. The agent is the one who makes your decisions. The yes. principal um, uh, appoints the agent. Oh, it's, it's his one. But the, the Patients' Rights Council is the one that puts out the document that's on my table, the Protective Medical Decisions document. And I would say that a, a lot of people generically call every advance directive a living will, but there's a big difference. A living will is one where you write down what you think you would wish if you ever couldn't make your own decisions for yourself. Uh, 
durable power of attorney for health care is one in which you appoint an agent to make decisions for you. That's the one that I recommend. And what they said is that you should have one of those documents because you're appointing someone who's going to make decisions for you. Remember, it's only legal, only in place, at least in almost every state I've heard of, when you can't make decisions for yourself. So you have someone who you've appointed to make decisions for you. And secondly, the language in the document is there to protect you. And language is everything. Because what means one thing to you might mean something else to another person. You have to have properly written protective language, and those documents have it. We sell one, too, for Canada. so. We, of course, advocate it. All right, our next question um, seems to be directed more towards Alex. Why is the battle assisted suicide rather than stealth euthanasia, which seems to be accepted in all states? Well, I don't know if that's uh, a question to me. Stealth euthanasia is going on under, it's going under, on, uh, under the covers. You don't know what's going on. Uh, it's something that, that uh, needs to be exposed. And the fact of it is, is because of certain uh, rules and definitions and language, you have these things going on which should really be illegal. It's, 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 it's really actually, if you come down to it, a combination of, uh, of euthanasia and uh, medical abuse is what you would call it. Uh, when we're talking about uh, giving somebody uh, uh, who has no need for morphine, they, they might be nearing death or might not be nearing death, but they seem quite comfortable but in order to push it through very quickly, they give them some large dose of morphine. Uh, that could be called euthanasia, yes, and it could also be called an abuse because obviously there was no purpose for it. And what was its accomplishment? It was to kill somebody. It wasn't to, it wasn't to make them comfortable. So um, that's how it goes. But the, the difference also is assisted suicide tends to be illegal almost everywhere. And, uh, and we want to keep it that way. The fact is, if, if, uh, if things are going on today, and this is what the other side says, oh, you don't have to worry. We're going to have rules in place, and you'll all be protected. We can legalize assisted suicide, and everything will be fine. And guess what? We've got all this abuse going on already. You think it's not going to be abused? That's ridiculous to say it's not going to be abused. And on top of it, who is the victim? Who is the person who dies? There's a few people out there who are radical autonomous. That's correct. And they will be seeking assisted suicide to, for their end goal that they're going to die in control, and there's a few people like that, and for everybody else, we'll just be killed. So, you know, if things are bad enough as they are now, and that's correct, and we need to do something about it, uh, it gets worse again if you legalize assisted suicide. And then the other thing, as I said, euthanasia and assisted suicide, they're two birds of a feather, they flock together. You can't separate them really in the end. And so, in the end, you sort of have a quasi-euthanasia going on. In fact, you sort of had that in Oregon now. Because remember, there's no witness at the time of death in Oregon. So we don't know how the person died. All we know is a lethal dose was taken. That's all we know. We don't know how the person died. We've got no idea. Um, Joe Tolk wanted me to tell you that in your bag is uh, advanced medical directives explanation of what they are, if anybody is confused. Legalization of assisted suicide on top of it. You know, once you start seeing people regularly dying of dehydration, and this is considered normal, I mean, people who are, have a head injury, they're not otherwise dying, and we're killing them by dehydration. Gosh, you know, give me lethal injection quick. I'd rather die that way. No, honestly, really. Wouldn't you rather, like, who's talking about compassion here? They say it's all about compassion and choices, and they're advocating dehydration. Who wants to die by dehydration? Come on, let's be honest. No one does. So it really does push the agenda forward. Oh, well, that's a much better end, isn't it? All right, last question. Um for Julie, how are Catholic hospitals treated under Patient Self-Determination Act regarding living wills? Are they exempt from it? Catholic hospitals are not exempt. They receive Medicare and Medicaid reimbursements, and they must follow the same rules. One thing about um, the, uh, the PSDA, the, the uh, Patient Self-Determination Act, is that it has increased costs it has increased paperwork. It has increased all kinds of um, difficulties for the hospitals and, and expense. And yet, it has not increased much the number of people who've signed advanced directives because people are kind of smart. <laughs> they don't want a right to die. It, no matter how these are presented to them, that's why we needed feudal care. That's why we needed POLST because people weren't doing what they were supposed to do according to the right to die folks. 
So another thing about Pulse that I think is um, <coughs> extremely interesting is Compassion and Choices calls it the most effective, the strongest advanced directive there is out there. Compassion and Choices calls it that. That's a big red flag to me. All right, can we get a hand for our panel? Their belief, they devalue life, and therefore you're at a disadvantage. And all the patient advocates, you can do much to help that loved one who is a patient, but it's very difficult. And why should the patient have to fight just to get ordinary good health care? And why should the family have to fight to get what used to be the norm? But society's turned upside down. The values are reversed of the divine law and natural law and what God would want. And the spiritual mission of health care has been lost. So after many years, I've been wrestling with this because I get the stories, like Mary, I have people calling me all the time hysterically crying, they killed my mother or this, or I think I killed my own mother because they lied to me and told me to give this. And it's like, well, what can we do? What can we do? God help, what can we do? And being a patient advocate is not enough to stop it because it's like an avalanche of death. Uh, it's a whole healthcare system that has been taken over. So giving information, I mean, you can go to my website, Hospice Patients Alliance, and you can get any information you want about the standards of care about hospice and every question you could possibly have. But it's not enough. So I said, well, what is the real answer? And the real answer is you need to have the pro-life nurse, the pro-life doctor. Well. I'm a pro-life nurse, there's Kristen and others, but I get calls from nurses who have been fired or harassed out of their workplace or who have quit because they're intimidated by the culture of death managers who say, you're speaking up about uh, our policy and you don't fit in here and they'll harass them and get rid of. So there's a move also to purge the pro-life, nurse, doctor, social worker, everything, so they're only culture of death professionals. They may be very technical, but they don't revere life. So this is horrific for the patient. It becomes just a, uh, it's, not, it's not what it's supposed to be. Anyway, the answer is you have to have the pro-life hospice, like Kristen's, you have to have a pro-life hospital. For example, St. Jude's, everybody knows St. Jude's uh, Children's Hospital, Danny Thomas and all the, that kind of thing. You have to have a facility that's dedicated top to bottom to the pro-life mission. And you need pro-life doctors and pro-life clinics. I have a friend, Kim Kubler. She's a professor of palliative care medicine and she teaches the palliative uh, approach of supporting the life of the patient through the spectrum of their life to relieve suffering, but supporting life at every stage, never imposing death. And this is what we need. So what can we do? And as I said, it's very tragic. It's in some of the Catholic, health, you would think the Catholic healthcare system should be pro-life because the teaching of the Vatican and the divine law is to honor life, but it's not always followed. So I, uh, I felt called that we have to create a pro-life healthcare alliance, something to create new healthcare agencies. So anyway, we're creating a pro-life uh, healthcare alliance and um, it will be top to bottom, um, revering the life that God gives, recognizing that God is the source of life, that he is, and that uh, the life we serve is from him, and therefore we have a duty to serve that life, 
and we will be creating new pro-life hospices. You cannot reform a culture of death hospice that has administrators and staff who are trained in killing and thinking that way. So we, if we can find a pro-life hospice or a pro-life hospital or clinic, we will associate with them and join them together uh, in association, this alliance, and all the pro-life advocacy organizations as well to join together to support each other. You know there's a World Federation of Right to Die Societies, and they are the ones who are funding the assisted suicide initiatives in this country. There's money coming from outside this country. There's money coming from outside different states to pass culture of death laws. We need something that will unite all of us together. And the pro-life movement, many are divided. They have a different, a slightly different approach. And that's um, self-defeating. You know, we're divided and conquered in that sense. And we have to stop fighting amongst ourselves and recognize that the mission of um, the spiritual mission is to serve life, and that's what God wants. So we can become missionaries for life wherever we are, however we serve. We're not creating a bureaucracy, but we're going to renew the vision that God has of what we're supposed to be doing in healthcare at any stage, whether it's a pregnancy resource center or what Mary's doing, um, what Kristen's doing, the pro life hospice, and also the educational centers. We want to hopefully attract, uh, there, there actually is uh, maybe one or two um, Catholic pro-life medical schools in the country, Dr. Byrne tells me, Paul Byrne, um, and uh, if we can get them and some hospitals and doctors, other people to come together and then wherever they are, some will be called to come forward and say, I want to help in that work and create a pro-life hospice here or in Pennsylvania or in Africa or anywhere. This is anywhere anyone wants to do this. We want to renew the pro-life vision because it's been lost in the global culture. And uh, so, so anyway, um, we're having a meeting. <laughs> and uh, that's uh, basically what we're um, going to do. And, uh, you know, I thought about this, and uh, God has sent some people to uh, just out of the blue. So I think uh, this is what he wants, and we can do it. And you may think that the culture of death is very powerful, but God is more powerful.